above the western horizon. And I knew this plan to be dangerous. And it was also dazzling mm -hmm. bright. There were other stars as well, um, but these two objects shone with such radiance that they made all of the other heavenly bodies uh, seem remote by comparison. And indeed, apart from the sun, these are the two brightest objects in the sky, period. It's the sun, then the moon, and then Venus. Now, that night, as I looked up, I just began to wonder about the intensity of the brightness and why it was that they were so bright. And the answer, uh, while obvious, I think you probably don't know this, is still, to me, thrilling. Thrilling to consider. And the answer is that the source of their light is an object which has gone entirely out of view, that is, the sun. So moonlight is actually not moonlight. It's sunlight. Moonlight is sunlight. And Venus, even though we call her the evening star, is of course not a star at all. She is a planet. And therefore, likewise, she does not possess her own principle of radiance. Her light, too, comes from the sun. And I found it comforting to know that even though the sun had gone down, he was still with us throughout the night in the reflection of the moon and the evening star. We never really lose the sun, even at night. And this is true not just in a symbolic sort of way. The light that evening, if you're still out tonight, um, the light coming from the moon is something. That's what's hitting your eye. So as I as I pondered these things, as I wondered about these things, um, these musings began to take on a kind of heavenly character. And this is what can happen if you're not careful. Um, as I looked at the moon, I was suddenly struck by its resemblance to something that I had based upon countless times, but it had never once associated with this heavenly body. And that is the Eucharist. The full moon was like a white post, perfectly round, suspended, elevated in the sky. And the evening star, Venus, of course, goes by another name, which is better known to Catholics, and that is the morning star. And this is one of those rich poetic names uh, that is given to Our Lady in the Whitney of Loretta. And here I was beginning to see why. Uh, from a scientific point of view, Venus is called both the morning and evening star because unlike the other planets, she is always within 45 degrees of the sun. And so she is seen either preceding the sun's rise or following the sun's set. As the morning star, she heralds the advent of the sun, shining not with her own light, but with the light of the sun, which remains yet hidden from our view. So far, so good. But the plot thickens. It takes Venus about half a year. No, excuse me. It takes Venus about a year and a half, 18 months, to make the entire journey from morning star back to evening star. Okay. And when she appears at her brightest as the morning star, she is roughly halfway up the eastern horizon, and it's by far the brightest object within the and astronomers today refer to this moment when Venus is at the greatest elongation from the sun as her apparition. I think that's an interesting word for us. And then gradually, over the course of several months, she moves back towards, recedes back towards the sun until she is no longer visible at sunrise at all because, of course, she cannot with the 
radiance of the sun. And this movement back from apparition to occlusion takes nine months. As I put these things together, my heart leapt up, as the poet Wordsworth says. Here I was gazing into the night sky and witnessing some of the most intimate details of the drama of our salvation quietly playing out. The story of the morning star and her first apparition and moment of glory, full of grace at the Annunciation, and then the nine month confinement followed by the birth of her Lord, uh, the birth of her son, our Lord at sunrise, and then the hiddenness of Our Lady during his life. And then, of course, her return to us after the ascension as the evening star, the first mediatrix of grace in his life. And then, shining most brightly of all, the moon, a humble rock, made glorious and transformed by the light of the sun. So this was thrilling to me, and it still is, uh, as, the, as the primal force of darkness lies over the earth, Our Lady and the Eucharist remain behind to give us their light, and to remind us that while the sun may not be visible now, he is very much present, and not symbolically Really. This was to be, I suppose, an experience of theophany, that is, the manifestation of God in the visible world. And this experience uh, filled me with joy uh, and that tingling ear that we call wonder. And these two elements, joy and wonder, form the basis for what G.K. Chesterton describes as man's highest state of being, gratitude. Gratitude tells us is happiness doubled by wonder. So I was awash in gratitude then, and I remain grateful for that evening's musings, which fundamentally changed the way that I look at the night sky. But it also changed the way that I look at all of God's creation. And it set me off. It set me off on a certain line of inquiry. I started to wonder if all the natural world had this character of being itself, but also being poetically linked to supernatural realities, almost like a three-dimensional pictogram. Think of the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe uh, on the tilma, which the Aztecs instantly read and understood. And leave. This is the notion that the world is itself, but is also a sign. It's an icon. It's a, a language that we are invited to read. Sacred scripture is awash in poetry, in stories and images that were both themselves, but also pointed to deeper truths. So could it be that the book of nature is also like this? Could it be read? like scripture, both literally and poetic. And moreover, are those two stories, that is, uh, of scripture uh, and the story of nature, so the book of divine revelation and scripture, and then the book of creation, are these two things symphonic with each other? Do they rhyme with each other? And then lastly, what is our role in all of this? What's our role? What's our responsibility as an observer, as a participant in this story? So it's along these lines that I hope to travel with you here for just a few more moments uh, this evening. So the title for my talk is Liturgical Dinner, Joining Creations of praise. I'm not really going to talk directly about liturgy per se, not the way that we immediately think of liturgy. I'm not going to talk about different rites. Uh, and 
not really even going to get into the liturgical year that much. This is a topic that is dear to me and my wife uh, in our home, the liturgical year. Feasts and fasts, the saints, and, and the seasons. And those things are uh, very, very important uh, and, and worth uh, a, talk, a talk of their own. Uh, Tonight, what I really want to focus on is something that is, I think, more fundamental and more prior to those things. It's just a kind of way of looking at the world and inhabiting the world. What Flannery O'Connor calls the habit of being. It's just a way of being. And I want to talk about specifically a liturgical habit of being. Okay, so here's how we're going to proceed. Um, part one, what do we mean by creation's canticle of praise? Here we're going to look at some scripture, and then also to some perennial ideas, notably uh, the idea of the music of the spheres. All right, that second... How do we participate in this canticle? How do we tune ourselves, as it were, to the music? And this will be in some ways rather practical. It's also the longest section. I have a few ideas, a few suggestions for how we can uh, join the band. And then finally, part three, what does, uh, what does any of this have to do with liturgy and liturgical liturgy? And here I will try to make the case that man's role in the canticle of praise is essentially that of liturgist. And he is, in the band, the lead singer. All right, so part one then, creation's canticle of praise. So let's quickly uh, define our terms working backwards. Praise is an expression of gratitude and glorification. Through praise, glory and honor are given to that which is praiseworthy. The most praiseworthy thing is, of course, God. By canticle, we mean a song. Canticle comes from the Latin cantare, meaning to sing. So a canticle of praise is glorification that is done in a musical sort of way. And then finally, the use of the word creation uh, here, creation's canticle of praise, implies, I think, the natural world, excluding man. So we're talking about the heavens, the earth, the land, water, the birds, and beasts. So to rephrase this then, nature's canticle of praise, we have in nature already a band playing a song for the glorification of God, whether we are at the concert or not. And the Old Testament is loaded with such imagery. Psalm 1, uh, 148 is a prime example. It means, Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the highest. Praise him, sun and moon, Praise him, all ye stars and light. Praise him, ye highest heavens, and ye waters above the heavens. Praise the name of the Lord. For he spoke, and they were made. He commanded, and they were created. He established them forever and ever. He made a law that shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, ye dragons and all the beasts. Ye fire and hail, ye snow and ice, ye storm winds that obey his word, ye mountains and all ye hills, ye fruit trees and all ye cedars, ye beasts and all ye cattle, ye creeping things and flying birds, his glory filleth heaven and earth. The canticle of Daniel, which is the song that the three young men, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, 
<laughs> Three young men sang after the harrowing, harrowing ordeal of being cast into the fire and yet not consumed. And this is one of the loveliest uh, passages in, in all of Scripture. And it follows the same pattern. Sun and moon, bless the Lord, praise and exalt him above all forever. Stars of heaven, bless the Lord, praise and exalt him above all forever. Fire and heat, bless the Lord, praise and exalt him above all forever. And it goes on at length. It's very detailed. It's love. It mentions dolphins. It's the only species that gets mentioned. So, to me, the obvious question then is how? How do these things praise the Lord? Okay? How does fire and heat praise the Lord? How do the stars of the heaven, heavens praise the Lord? How does a dolphin praise the Lord? Some of them might make noises, sure, but none of them have a voice per se. So I, I think it is just a mysterious thing, and it's one that we should rightly wonder about. But we at least know this. That by divine revelation, we can be noticed by divine revelation, that God spoke creation into existence. The, psalm, the, the psalmist said just a moment ago, he spoke and they were made. Not he waved his wand and they were made. He spoke and they were made. St. John's prologue, perhaps the greatest lyric not just of the Bible, but if ever written, begins this way. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by him, and without him was made nothing that was made. This uh, verbum, this word, which spoke creation into being, must surely find a permanent echo in the created world. Something like a resonance or a tuning must have been put into that which was spoken. If not just put into it and left there, the world is not simply a divine tuning fork, which was once struck and then it's been just set aside to be slowly fade. Right? And so echo an echo may not be the best word because of an echo fades. This, we're talking about here something different. We're talking about a tune that is clearly held in continuing resonance and in continuing harmony with the divine word. God is imminent in his creation, and the divine melody that was once begun plays eternally and keeps the universe intact. And I think these theological truths are best approached through the language of poetry. Hopkins, Gerard Manley Hopkins, says that the world is charged with the grandeur of God. It's charged with the grandeur of God. This, this is like some sort of electrical like valence is a kind of tingling in nature. And he says, the poet says, it's never spent because the Holy Ghost brings over the world with warmth and brightness. So we kind of confront this kind of paradoxical wordless speech. Um, and the psalmist in Psalm 18 speaks of it this way. He says, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies declare the works of his hands. One day to another telleth the message. Night unto night conveyeth the tidings. Not speeches are these, not words. Their voices are not heard. Yet 
Their sound goeth forth to all the earth, and their speech to the end of the world. It says, their voices are not heard, and yet their sound goeth forth to all the earth, and their speech to the end of the world. So this, this wordless declaration of the heavens that the psalmist is referring to here, it harkens to another idea that really saw its zenith in popularity during the medieval age, namely the idea of the music of the spheres. The music of the spheres. The idea is this, in short, <coughs> the heavenly bodies, the planets, existed in concentric spheres with the earth at the center. And in their movements, they produce a kind of harmony or music, which we simply have just lost in ear for. We can't hear it. It's there. It kind of underpins everything. But we can't hear it anymore. In The Merchant of Venice, uh, Lorenzo says, under a starlit night, he says, How sweet the moonlight sleeps upon this bank. Here will we sit and let the sounds of music creep into our ears. Soft stillness in the night become the touches of sweet harmony. Sit, Jessica, and look how the floor of heaven is thick and laid with patines of bright gold. There's not the smallest form which thou beholdest, but in his motion, like an angel of sea. Still choiring to the young eyed cherubim. Such harmony is in the mortal soul. But whilst this muddy vesture of decay doth grossly close it in, we cannot hear it. This muddy vesture of decay being this mortal coil, this body that we have, we can't hear it. But it's there. So the idea of the music of the spheres, uh, and really the whole kind of cosmological pattern of the medieval world, gradually fell out of favor uh, after the Copernican model put the sun at the center of the solar system. And so it sort of upset that, that cosmic pattern uh, or paradigm. But I think it would be altogether premature to suppose that somehow the fundamental truth of the music of the spheres has therefore been debunked. Firstly, let's not imagine, for instance, that the, front, that, that the final frontier has been reached in our understanding of the architecture of the universe. I think modern science has been nothing if not inconsistent. Yes, it put a man on the moon. But it also uh, somehow thought that feeding large rent to said astronaut was a good idea. <laughs> Getting him prepared for that. Large rent a substance with the half life of, of uh, plutonium. <laughs> it, it, it really does turn out, uh, I think we all know this, that what we think by intuition and instinct, that is by common sense, uh, is usually right. We all need to eat more butter. That's, that's the point. <laughs> Meanwhile, Scripture is quite clear that the heavens proclaim the glory of God, and that this sound goeth forth to all the earth. According to C.S. Lewis, this sound, this music of the heavens, this music of the spirits, according to Lewis, is the only sound which has never for one split second ceased in any part of the universe. Presumably if, which is impossible, it never did stop. Then with terror and dismay, with the dislocation of our whole auditory life, we should feel that the bottom had dropped out of our lives. End quote. But the music doesn't stop, and it will never stop, 
And the result is a universe that Lewis goes on to describe as teamly. And there's that word again, teamly. Teamly with anthropomorphic life, dancing, ceremonial, a festival, not a machine. Mm -hmm. So I felt that deeply that night 20 years ago. And it is precisely in this kind of embodied uh, and incarnational world that I wish to live. I think we wish to live. And not because it is a fancy, not because it is a temporary escape or distraction from the whole vast dread cosmos, um, but rather because it's beautiful, and it's good, and it's true. In other words, it's real. And so we must neither choose to believe that the world is in shape and is truly charged with the grandeur of God. Or that it is, or that it's not. And, we, and if we think that it is enchanted, we ought to give some consideration to what it would mean to live well in such a kind of place as that, and how we might see things better for what they truly are. So this brings me to part two. How do we participate? How do we join? in nature's canticle of praise. How do we step in and inhabit and become a part of that fairy tale? I think in the first place, we just need to acknowledge, briefly, we don't need to overdo it, we just need to acknowledge that we have largely gone out of tune. We are out of tune with God's creation. We have become strangers in our own home. Uh, the, the poet Wordsworth, I think, puts this best in, in a song. Probably my favorite thing in the world. It goes like this The world is too much with us late and soon. Getting and spending, we lay waste our power. Little we see in nature is ours. We have given our hearts away a sordid boon. The sea that bears her bosom to the wind, the winds that will be howling at all hours, and are up gathered now like sleeping flowers. For this, for everything, we are out of tune. It moves us not. Great God, I'd rather be a pagan, suckled in a tree outworn, so might I, standing on this pleasant lee, have glimpses that would make me less overwhelmed. A sight of Proteus rising from the sea, hear old Triton blow his raven horn. So I think we have they raised our powers, as Wordsworth says, especially the powers of perception. We just don't see very well anymore. And for that reason, we've got ourselves out of tune. So the question is, how do we get ourselves back into tune? I'm going to offer three fairly practical things that I think we can do. In the first place, I think we should read often the book of Genesis. And we should try to do the things that we were asked by our Creator to do. <laughs> Let's start by naming things again. Let's start by naming things again. From Genesis. And the Lord God, having formed out of the ground all the beasts of the earth and all the bowels of the air, brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. For whatsoever Adam called any living creature, the same is its name. 
We should return to naming things if we want to begin bridging the gap in our relationship with God through his creation. So when we are first introduced, we give each other our names. That's the first thing that we do. And this isn't because our names strictly define us. And they don't even particularly give any information. We give our names because the first thing that a person needs to know is what do I call you? That is, how do I invoke you? How do I invoke you? Pope Benedict XVI says, quote, We have to be clear about what a name actually is. We could put it very simply by saying that the name creates the possibility of address or invocation. It establishes relationship. When Adam names the animals, what this means is not that he indicates their essential natures, but that he fits them into his human world, puts them within reach of his call. End quote. So let's note here again that naming something is not the same as defining it. Pope Benedict is clear that man's business in naming is not to give the beasts their natures. Their natures have already been given to them. God, but it's rather to establish a connection to those natures, a bridge, as it were. Stratford Talicott, uh, in his book, Beauty of the Word, a magnificent book, by the way, I highly, highly recommend for, uh, for me in the work of preparing um, and articulating the pedagogical vision uh, at St. Martin's Academy. Uh, his, his work has been at the, at the very top uh, in terms of helping us uh, articulate um, our kind of core commitments. It, he says in his book, Beauty and Word, that naming is actually the key move in language itself. Here's what he says. The archetypal moment of language is that of naming. Naming overcomes the gap between the self who names and the thing that is named. And it is this that enables us to inhabit the world in a completely new way. So, my daughter uh, Rose is uh, one and a half. And she is just beginning to take an interest um, in a new kind of way, in the world beyond herself and beyond her mom. Uh, and so she points at things. The rosy points at things. And she says, Sam. Sam. Who's that? What's that? That's that's a bird, Rosie. That's a bird. She's pleased by this. She likes this reply. And the next time she sees a bird, she points at it and says, oh. Oh. <laughs> uh, Meanwhile, my son, Liam, is now four years old, and his interest in naming has continued. But he wants to know He's in the specifics now. He's in the specifics. So look, that book, a red bird, a red bull. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a cardinal. <clears throat> and then the next day, look at that. A cardinal. So his, his relationship here is moving from uh, genus to species, going from bird. Pardon, he's getting more he's getting more specific. But this really is the first move for us as we're starting to establish a relationship to the world around us. We just have to know the names of things. Um, and I think several things begin to happen when we start learning the names of things. 
Uh, in the first place, naming does relate to authority, and that's why the parents name their children, and that is why we are not permitted to name our guardian angels. We're not given that authority. We can't give our guardian angels name. We don't have that kind of authority over them. As parents, we can certainly give our own children names. That is our, our right. Adam's prerogative to name creation is uh, related to his dominion over. And uh, on the way up uh, here this afternoon, I finally uh, got my the car, the, the truck stereo, to work. And so uh, we were listening to, to some music, and one of my daughters asked if we could listen, listen to some Bob Dylan. And uh, said, absolutely. And so I turned on. Um, one of my favorite Dylan songs. And this song uh, is just pure, pure genius. Um, and it talks specifically about this idea of the power of me. Right? So this is from his uh, album called Slow Train Company, uh, which he wrote after he had a conversion to Christianity. Yeah. This is my favorite song on that album. It's called, it's called, Man Gave Names to All the Animals. Has anyone heard this song? Do not listen to this song. It's immediately catchy and lovely and delightful. Okay? It sounds like a kid's song. In a way, it is. But there's some really deep truths happening in this song. Uh, so, the song just progresses. Adam sees this thing, it acts in a certain way, he gives it a name. He goes through a pig, a sheep, a bear, a cow. And at the very end, there's a very strange creature slithering in the grass. Right? And before Adam gets to call, out that to give it a name and to take dominion over it. It disappears. And the song ends abruptly. And you take it from the It's weird. That's still a story of genius right there. Adam, didn't, Adam did not have a proper authority. He did not exercise proper dominion over mm -hmm. that snake. Yeah. So, still is a genius. Now, beyond authority, um, and more important, I think, than authority, naming is the first step towards friendship. You just can't love what you don't know. And if we have fallen out of love with nature, it is in large part because we just don't know nature very well anymore. I remember uh, as a kid, my dad being given a field guide to the birds of North America by his mentor and partner uh, in his medical practice, Dr. James Good. And there was a short inscription inside the book which said simply, birds are friends when you know their name. Birds are friends when you know their name. And if any of you have ever caught even the slightest bit of uh, the bird watching book, which is a glorious affliction. <laughs> You'll know immediately the deep truth of this statement. The big difference before you know what, what to call a bird, the relationship to it, there's a certain kind of distance to it. Once you know its name, you're on, you're on speaking terms. Literally, it's your friend now. So, finally, naming things develops attentiveness. Uh, Wordsworth's line previously, little we see in nature that is ours, is largely true for us because we just uh, we just really don't see much at all. Uh, never mind seeing particulars of nature. We just don't see that much. 
Uh, this is the subject of a short and lovely essay by Joseph Pieper <laughs> called uh, Learning How to See Again, in which Pieper laments the loss of modern man's physical capacity to see things. So, whereas medieval man was keenly aware of his physical environment and would have known immediately and intimately every tree, every bee, every flower, every insect in his view. We have lost what Sherlock Holmes calls the art of noticing. We are largely, as a society, and I'm not leveling this accusation against folks, I just mean, in general, we are out of tune. We're out of touch, we're out of tune. Okay. So, as good localists, we should first attend and pay attention to our own backyard. Uh, I was walking around campus here with Dr. McCollum before, uh, before coming in here, and this is a, this is a beautiful campus. It's really it's a beautiful campus. The landscaping is magnificent, and there are uh, some wonderful trees <laughs> and flowers. And for you students who are here, I would strongly recommend you learn the names of these trees. No doubt about it. Little trees. Oh, but there, there are all kinds of ornamental trees here, here as well. So you have a nice mix of native and um, kind of more exotic or ornamental trees. So if you, this is your backyard while you're here uh, at the college. And you should learn the names of the trees here. And if possible, I don't know, is it possible? Is it possible to have some bird seeds around here, Dr. Mullen? We have such things. So if you put up put up some put up some bird just Dr. Mullen, right? Put up some bird. <laughs> uh, and uh, if you do that, your distant friends will grow. Okay? Your distant friends will grow. And your heart will, will dilate just a little bit more on the ancient calendar. All right, so my second suggestion then from Genesis would be to heed the first commandment to tend a garden. About gardening, there is much that could be said, but Nature will teach you these things if you just put your hands into the soil. One of my favorite contemporary uh, secular authors is a neuropsychiatrist. Uh, his name is uh, Dr. Oliver Sacks. Can you remember Dr. Oliver Sacks? Yeah. Uh, he's written several very interesting books. My favorite is one that is called The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. <laughs> And Chester Tony. Sort of, uh, <laughs> now, Sachs's patients were folks who had often suffered some kind of deep neurological uh, trauma. And for many, this included a terrible, really, a terrible kind of dislocation from the world around them. Some of them even being entirely estranged from their own bodies. A really severe uh, neuropsychiatric. Issues. And Sachs, at the end of his life, identified two things which, even better than the very best pharmaceuticals that he uh, ever used, helped to reintegrate his patients with their environment. And those two things were music and gardening. Music and gardening. So, we should all try to keep a garden, no matter how modest in scale. You need good dormants, you can grow some herbs, you should. Or basil plant, so you can keep the basil plant alive through the winter. It's a challenge. Um, I think we'll all be less anxious if we are to keep a garden. Uh, I have I have three kinds of uh, breeds of dogs at home. 
We have a Great Pyrenees, uh, an English Shepherd, which looks like a Border Collie, <laughs> and in many ways it's very similar. And then a, uh, a Rat Terrier. We have a big dog, no big dog, medium dog, small dog. Um, the, great, the job of the Great Pyrenees is simply to watch. It's just vigilance. The job of the English Shepherd is kind of this dog wants to drive. It wants to it wants to boss and control things. Uh, children, livestock, the students at St. Martin's. And then my little rat terrier. Uh, his job is to kill birds. That's what he wants to do. He doesn't want to. He doesn't want to play with it after it's dead. He just he just wants. He wants to kill rats. So he's bred to do it. So each of them has been bred to do a really specific job, and they're happy that they're doing their job. And they are nervous and neurotic and disruptive. If they can't do their job. And guess what? We're like dogs. We are like dogs in this world. Right? We are gardeners. Primarily, we are gardeners. And we are happiest when we're doing the job that our master gave us to do, which was to tend the garden. So we can do that. Now, my final suggestion, practical suggestion for getting back into God's creation, is to read poetry. To read, to recite, and if possible, to even write a little poetry. Creation's language is far more poetic than prosaic. Creation has a rhythm, it has a cadence about it in the seasons, and in the cycles of life and death and renewal. It is stressed and unstressed. Creation is also itself, but it's full of signification of other things. It is like a pictograph in continuous motion. The divine poet is the best poet. And why should we think? that he isn't the master of the same rhetorical schemes and tropes which we appreciate in our best poets. Art is mimetic, after all, it imitates nature. And the, the natural result of reading poetry is to develop an imagination that is poetic. According to Aristotle, the chief sign of intelligence I think he, I don't think he uses the word intelligence. I think he says the mark of genius is the ability to bring two unlike things together and to see a new third thing which, with which they share a likeness. In other words, he says the mark of genius is the ability to make metaphors. And this is what a poetic imagination does. It synthesizes things. It brings disparate things together and sees their relationship. It sees how things rhyme and resonate. Let me give you an example. Uh, I remember fishing with my dad one day. And after a long period of silence, he said, uh, just out of nowhere, he said, uh, you know, it's no accident that Christ chose fishermen to meet his apostles. Can we just kind of pay off there? And he continued. Uh, he, he said, you know, fishermen believe in what they can't see. Right now, we don't we can't see these fish, but we know they're here. And what's more, you and I know well that the fish aren't going to bite. If we don't believe, we're going to catch them. Is anyone fish? Do you, do you know what I'm talking about here? 
You have to believe in the cash. And you're believing in something you can't see below the surface. And he said, yeah, you know, fishermen have the virtue of faith, whether they know it or not. And so my dad had a poetic imagination. And the connection between fishing and the virtue of faith is, is really an example of seeing a likeness between unlike things. And I think this is what Chesterton meant when he said, uh, it's a great quote, he says, the imagination has its highest use in retrospective realization. The function of the imagination is not so much to make strange things settled, but to make settled things strange. Not so much to make wonders facts as to make facts wonders. So the fact that St. Peter was a fisherman is plain, but that our Lord may have chosen him precisely because he was a fisherman is, I think, a bit wonderful. And if we're going to move in and find meaning in a world that is fundamentally poetic, we simply have to develop a poetic imagination. And then I believe we can begin to understand that all of reality it's not only unified, but it's symphonic. It rhymes. And things like fishing and faith are harmonized by the divine composer. Okay, so let's sum up part two briefly. Get back to Genesis, learn the names of things, tend our gardens, and read poetry. And if we do that, we will begin to bring ourselves back into to the work of the divine program. And our hearts will be up in gratitude. And that brings us to part three in our conclusion, which is liturgical living. Our hearts will be up in gratitude. And gratitude demands expression. In fact, I think one of the more painful experiences imaginable must be unconsummated gratitude. An old priest friend of mine relates a story of being aboard a cruise ship and going out on the deck one particularly beautiful evening <coughs> at sunset. He saw a man uh, from behind. Oh, was behind. The man was at the prow of the ship and he was staring into the sunset. And the man dropped his head, and Father could tell by his shoulders, which were shuddering, that the man was weeping, compulsively weeping, but weeping came so quietly. Uh, and Father, sensing a pastoral opportunity here, uh, approached the man and gently asked him if he were okay. And the man turned. <laughs> Father and said with what Father described as profound, profound sorrow. He pointed out to the sunset and he said, Look, it's so beautiful, and there's no one to thank for it. And that man, uh, Father, came to understand his name. And he felt this pain. He didn't know how to respond properly to beauty and to what was welling up inside of him, which was gratitude. Because in his mind, there was no other thing. And that, I think, was exquisitely painful. Consummated gratitude, on the other hand, finds its fulfillment in praise. How can we imagine? For example, St. Francis of Assisi's famous, beautiful masterpiece, The Canticle of the Sun, which was written at the end of his life, is anything but an overflowing of gratitude. He goes through, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to read the, the, the entire canticle. But he says, Be praised, my Lord, through all your creatures, especially through my Lord, brother, son, who brings the day. And you get light through him, and he is beautiful 
and the radiance and all the splendor of you, most high, he bears the likeness. He praised my Lord to your sister, moon of the stars, and the heavens you have made him precious and beautiful. He goes on. Brothers of Midmanair, sister of water, brother of fire, highly talks about sister of death. He's coming to this. I think this expression of praise um, on behalf of all of creation, what St. Francis is doing here, is mysteriously and profoundly at the heart of all of liturgy, the liturgy itself, and the liturgical habit of doing. So earlier in reciting Psalm 148, um, I played a little bit of a trick by leaving out the bookends of the litany. The angels at the beginning and man at the end. And in this way, Psalm 148 follows Genesis in the order of creation. The angels, highest heaven, sun and moon, water and man, beasts and birds, and finding man and soul. Man is the culmination of creation. He is a composite of and therefore comprehends all that comes before him. He is part angel part mineral, part vegetable, part animal. He is a microcosm of all God's creation. So let's hold that up for a moment. Meanwhile, liturgy, the word, comes from two Greek words, laetos and ergos. Laetos means public, and ergos means work. Laetorgia, in Greek, meant a public service. And the highest public service that was rendered was the offering of sacrifice to the gods. And this was done almost exclusively by those whom fortune had favored and who had the dove or the lamb to offer. Well, I would say this, that fortune has favored us, fortune has favored mankind, because God made us, especially in his image and likeness. He is the big word, and we are little words. He can also speechify and sing, and we can offer the greatest public service to the cosmos by giving something that only we can give. Is a voice. We are the spokesmen for creation. And we can offer a sacrifice of glorious praise on behalf of sun and moon, fire and rain, donkeys and dolphins. And in doing so, we joined in the great symphony of praise, the unending sanctus, sanctus, sanctus. That is the music of the heavens. A priest of the Gulags, Father Pavel Florensky, wrote, quote, Our liturgy is older than us and our parents. Our liturgy is even older than the world. The liturgy was not invented. It was discovered. It is something that always was. It comes not from man, but from the angels. End quote. So, Let's return uh, to the stars and, and wrap this up. If you let that, if you ever, I don't wonder if anyone's had this experience. If you ever lay underneath the night sky, and it's important that you lay down and peer intently into it, you might suddenly have the experience of vertigo. Uh, as if up is actually down, and that you are pinned to the ceiling, and that at any instant you might fall down into heaven. Have you been able to have that experience? Yeah. Yeah, lay down. Have this experience. If you've never had this experience, do a try. It's unnerving. It's, it's good. And this Flipping upside down reminds me 
of what G.K. Chesterton said about St. Francis of Assisi when he referred to him as uh, the jungler de Dieu, which is the juggler of God. In uh, true Chestertonian style, uh, Chesterton says that St. Francis saw things rightly because he was standing upside down on his head. And that the view of the world and ourselves in such a state is one of radical, radical dependence. Everything is hanging, as it were, in the balance. And that is precisely true. Everything is hanging in the balance, and it's held there by the love that supports the universe. And I think we would do well to return often to this perspective because it will draw us towards that fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. And we might even become a little humble, a trait that, according to the saints, heaven finds irresistible. This is the special power of the John Virgin II. Chesterton said that Francis stood on his head in the first place, not because he sought enlightenment, but simply because, like the clown of God, it made a lady smile. I think the restoration of culture will only happen when our hearts are consecrated to the Blessed Virgin, the most powerful creature in the universe, our life, our sweetness, our hope. Let our own program be in life to make a waiting smile. Morning star, day of heaven, wish for us. We have some time for Q and A. You ever have an experience where you see a great movie or see a great play or read a great book and you tell your friend and they're like, oh, that was so great. Like, I feel like having you here. <laughs> it's that kind of experience, right? Because I can sense it in the room. Even though Sister left, I don't know what you said. <laughs> but does anybody have a question? I'm going to give this to you so that those who are participating in this cybernetic community. That's a really very good question. You need some good adversity here. Okay, so you want a suit feeder for the winter time. And then you want a thistle feeder uh, that, uh, that it's a particular kind of feeder. Um, very fun because the thistle seed is extremely small. But that's what attracts gold fingers in particular in the winter. And then uh, you want just a good all around feeder that has good of these. Okay. With plenty of uh, sunflowers. I guess you take them to the Benedict and Bottom. You get those acres things. and acres of bird sanctuary. It's all right. Oh, yes. That's all yeah. Well, yeah. So those those three yeah. at least. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. That was so much. Be on the lookout uh, for up here. Uh, pretty, be on the lookout for is scarlet tanager. Anyone see a scarlet tanager? Yeah. yeah. Right. Absolutely spectacular. Really. Oh, is that right? Okay. Well, they're they would be passing through on migration. You you mentioned uh, gardening and music as two ways to be be in touch with the world, and and then you spoke about gardening. What is it about music that that allows us to be in more touch with the world? Well, you know. I think the fundamental nature of the cosmos is that it is musical, right? 
that that's the idea of the the fundamental rather than slide that the fundamental nature I think of the cosmos, of the cosmos in the structure of all of reality is, is music. Um, the more you delve into that, it's, it's, a, it's a marvelous thing. Proportionality uh, and the way these things uh, work work together. And so, you know, Darwin didn't know what to do with music. He didn't understand it. He didn't understand how it fit into the whole scheme of evolution because it seemed pointless. You know, it didn't seem to have a real clear function. Um, but I think music can, uh, I think, can put us, we are built to be tuned. That's what I mean. That's what Plato very clearly says in, in many of his dialogues. That the way we're built and constructed, we are meant to be put into tune. And so, music has a super powerful effect on us because that's the way we're made. Right. So, I think we have to be really careful to to listen to good music, but we should be we should be musical. Right. I mean, Shakespeare. Uh, Says Mark the man who mm -hmm. does not like music, they are not to trust. <laughs> so we are fundamental, fundamentally musical people uh, because that is the way all of creation has been constructed. That, yeah, okay, perfect. Then, fine. What would you say to the claims of folks like Joseph Cooper and Charles Taylor who would say that? Is either no longer possible or very extraordinarily difficult for contemporary people to live in an enchanted way. Well, they're not wrong. It is very, very difficult. Um, because I mean, that's the whole point of C.S. Lewis's book, The Discarded Image. He's talking about the medieval kind of view of the cosmos. You saw it as enchanted. And you know, it's, it's difficult for us. We, we don't see, it's just in the air we breathe as we come of age, we live in a very materialistic society um, that is secular and is absolutely disenchanted. Uh, so we have to make deliberate and intentional interventions if we want to get, our, you know, to get through the round. And the work that's got to be done, I believe, has to be done primarily in the imagination. That's where that's where it happens, and that's where we lose the battle. We're losing the battle is in the development of our imagination. Um, so, if your question is, what, what do I say to to where? Uh, proposal. Their statement that it is difficult. Yeah, absolutely. It's difficult. Absolutely. It's difficult. Uh, that's why I've been used to reading C.S. Lewis and G.K. Chesterton um, and reading the, the thousand you know, good books uh, that John Cena talked about. And then in, 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 kind of more negatively, we really have to start fasting from our technological dependence and, and get off these screens now. Because of an absolute curse. And how could you possibly dream of inhabiting a world that you see as enchanted if your primary mode of existence is this? Yeah, absolutely. Two more questions. I see someone advancing. I'm always protecting of sneakers, especially after the whole Will Smith slap thing. <laughs> Be careful. I see Professor Schmerbeck coming down. So. <laughs> I just want to make you walk all the way up the stairs. I was trying to be you know, respectful of my superiors and elders, as it were. <laughs> um, thank you. <laughs> Um, 
I think what I love the metaphor that you provided here about nature and just the liturgical life. And I guess I was wondering if you thought about how sin fits into the picture. Because I think there's a sense of when we think of, even when you think about the music of the spheres and you think of balance and harmony and all of those things, and I have an idea of an answer, but I didn't know if you had thought about this already. Let's hear the Let's hear it right Okay, okay. Well, no, I, got, I, I actually fully brought up the question of music, right? Because harmony and disharmony, like in order for music to have a whole, there's a certain sense where you need the minor chord or you need the discord in, in order to get to the resolution. It maybe even filters into Ben's question about, um, you know, can we, you know, according to what's Taylor Peabert, is this even possible? And I think the sense is, is nature is the best example of sort of, you know, there's degradation and then there's renewal. There's all these cycles in the life of nature where things are rejuvenated in a way that is part of the essence of the thing. And so I think there's just this sense where if the music is perpetual and our, our nature is perpetual, then there is this sense where there may come a point where we reach the limits at which point nature resets itself. And then we have this, and I think you're totally right about imagination. But I'm just wondering if that's part of the clue or because you can't necessarily be entirely sin isn't the thing that keeps music from happening. Or is it? So, do you, do you mean to the Merchant of Venice when Lorenzo says, but well, it is bloody, vesture of the king, you cannot kill it? Mm -hmm. are, you, are, you, are you asking if sin is maybe what is cutting us off from the music? If it, or if it's part of the music, right? right. There, like, there's a sense of, right, the profound rest in the movement. There's, right, there's these breaks between pieces. I just, I'm wondering if it's part of the music or is it the anathema to the music? You know, Lewis talks about, in his, have you been in space trilogy? No. It's, not it's, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. And the, the first book is called Not of the Silent Planet. Mm -hmm. And there, if you get outside of the silent planet, the silent planet is Earth because of the fall, and it's gone quiet here. If you get outside of the sphere of the Earth and into the other spheres, they go to Mars, they go to Venus, you can hear the music of the spheres there, or you're, you're more in tune to it. There's a kind of silence that has fallen over creation itself because of the fall. Mm -hmm. So Lewis has, I, I think that's a pretty interesting, uh, you know, way of, of, uh, of considering that. Um, but one of the stories that has a kind of rhythm to it, and texture to it, and light and dark, is the story of of, of salvation history and problems. And absolutely, I mean, both have to be called, right? And if so. Um, for the score of the genealogy of Christ. Yeah. With all of the different horrible music that <laughs> Right. Right. It's certainly there. I mean, like a beautiful tapestry, you have to have a thought to, to the light and, and really shine out and accentuate itself. Mm -hmm. 